Hello and welcome to our Sunday School lesson for April 4th, Easter Sunday in 2021, Resurrection Sunday. And so uh, we rejoice in the fact that he is risen. And if you were all in the classroom with me, you would say he is risen indeed. And so today uh, we're going to continue our study of the story of God. Our mini series on heaven and hell and the afterlife will continue. But today we're going to focus in a bit on the resurrection and the soul, more specifically the immortal soul. We're going to talk about the resurrection and the immortal soul, how the two interact with each other, how they have interacted in Christianity down through the centuries. And uh, I hope it'll be uh, an encouraging time together. So with this, let's go ahead and get started. The uh, core of the gospel uh, and if it seems like I share this lesson or a similar lesson every Easter Sunday, I always want to focus in on the resurrection on Easter Sunday. And so we'll focus in on the core of the gospel. First Corinthians 15, one through four. Now I declare to you, brothers, the good news, the gospel, which I preached to you, by which also you received, which you also you received and which you also stand, by which also you are saved if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And, uh, and Paul goes on to talk about how uh, Jesus was seen by the apostles and by 500 others and, uh, and so on. So this is a summary of the gospel. If anybody ever wants to know what is the gospel, this is it. Biblically speaking, this is the gospel. Remember that the gospel is good news. This is news about what Jesus has already done for us. But the, the key that we're focusing in today, again, because of, of it being uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday, is verse four there, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. So that which was buried was raised on the third day. And that resurrection is the prototype for the resurrection for the rest of us. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. He says in verse 20, he became the first fruits of those who are asleep. Those who are asleep referring to those of us who are dead. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ at his coming. Then the end comes when he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And again, he goes on, talks about uh, the last enemy to be defeated will be death. And so we have the resurrection. We have the, the good news that Jesus rose from the dead. And uh, as our uh, brother uh, Scott Davis shared a couple of weeks ago in church, um, this, there, there are so many ample historical evidences and truths of, of the bodily resurrection of Jesus leaving an empty tomb. Um, to me, the, the, the most convincing apologetic argument for the resurrection is what happened in the lives of the disciples and the apostles uh, after Jesus died. Um, Jesus was not the, the first nor the last person who claimed to be the Messiah. And one by one, the Messiahs were all either put to death or they died. And typically when they died, their movements died with them but not with Jesus. When Jesus died, his movement sprang up and turned into a world-changing phenomenon. So what was different about this Jewish Messiah as opposed to all the other ones? Well, this one rose from the dead. And to see the transformation in the lives of the apostles so that they were all willing to die, a horrible deaths of martyrs, with the possible exception of John, the apostle, all the rest died martyrs deaths. Why were they willing to do that? They're not going to do that for a lie. They'll do that for the truth. 
And the truth was that Jesus rose from the dead. And it was because of that that Christianity rose. And as N.T. Wright puts it, it took the shape that it did. But that's not the end. We're talking in our mini series about heaven and hell. What happens to human beings after we die? And this passage here in verse, verses 20 through 24 tell us that what happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. We too will be raised from the dead. He is, Jesus is the first fruits, but we too will be raised from the dead in the same way that Jesus was raised from the dead. But there's a problem with this. And that is, there's a huge, huge swath of Christianity that doesn't believe what I just shared, the gospel of the resurrection. Some studies that have been done, this is a, a, a compilation of various studies from various sources. There was a, a study uh, done a few years ago in England, got a lot of press. 25%, a full one fourth of British Christians do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They just simply don't believe it at all. Another 40% believe, but not as the Bible records it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what uh, is meant by that, other than to say that perhaps they believe in some sort of a spiritual rising, but not a bodily raising of Jesus' body from the grave, leaving an empty tomb. So put those two together, you got 65% of British Christians who do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, leaving an empty tomb. Barna did a, a research, uh, did some research, and I'm not sure who, uh, where his audience was. 30% uh, of the people that he surveyed, 30% of born again Christians, people that we might identify as evangelical Christians, do not believe Jesus bodily rose from the dead. 30%, a third, almost a third of Christians. With respect to the rest of us, Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven, indicates that 66% of Americans do not believe that they will have bodies after the resurrection. So why is this? What is going on here? Well, Paul asked the same question in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, and this is in the first century now, this is 20, 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Paul's writing to the Corinthians and he says, now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So this is his question. So the question that, that comes to my mind, when he says, how do some among you, who's he talking about? Who's he writing to? Who is he referring to as being the people who do not believe in resurrection? Now, I can't be absolutely certain because I don't know who was reading his letter, but we do know this. They were from Corinth. Duh. And he's re re specifically writing to Corinthians who are saying that there's no resurrection of the dead. So who are these people? Well, there are several possibilities, and it's probably a combination of all of these possibilities. First, we have the Sadducees. We know that the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe in any individual afterlife at all. For them, the Bible consisted of just the first five books of the Old Testament. These were five books that talked about the nation of Israel, what's going to happen to the nation of Israel. And these five books are very this worldly. They, they refer to Israel getting land and, and being promised land. And their salvation was to get that land and to be rescued from any oppressors who may be oppressing them at the time. But the Sadducees said there is simply no resurrection. Jesus did not rise from the dead, neither does anybody else. It just doesn't happen. Um, Sadducees are Jews. And, uh, and again, they believe very strictly in just the first five books of the, the Old Testament. But I don't think that 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 Paul is necessarily writing to Jews or to Sadducees in this passage. I don't think these are the only people that he's referring to. 
Remember that he's in writing to Corinthian. Corinth was a very worldly Greek city. It was a hub of business, of commerce and travel. And so there were a lot of Greek philosophical ideas floating around in Corinth. By the first century, uh, Platonic philosophy would have had a, a fairly strong hold uh, in Corinth, I would believe. And, and I mean, Plato had been around uh, around 400 BC and he was developing his ideas and again, Corinth being very worldly, being very Greek, very, uh, clearly his, Plato's ideas would have been very prominent in Corinth. With Plato, there was no bodily resurrection. With Plato, he didn't want a bodily resurrection. With Plato, there was the immortal soul that was not only immortal, but eternal. And what I mean by that is Plato believed that souls pre-existed creation. And that when a person is born, a soul is deposited in that person. He lives his life. And when he dies, the soul leaves that person. And, and for Plato, the immortal soul was the essence of the person. The body was just a shell. It was just uh, something to live in. And the body being material was inherently incomplete. And so Plato saw the the saw earthly death as being a release of the immortal soul from the body. In Plato's world, the immortal soul after death would go to Hades, where it would uh, live there forever in disembodied um, either bliss or torment, depending if you were good or bad. Um, Hades can be a good thing for, for Plato. Um, there, Hades has a good side and a bad side, and depending on your life on this earth, uh, you would be judged and you would end up in, in either the good or the bad side of Hades. But there is no bodily resurrection. And the last thing that Plato wanted was a bodily resurrection. Well, as I said, Plato was around uh, 400 BC. So by the time we get to the first century, there are a lot of, of uh, Hebrews and Jews who are developing and adopting Plato's teaching. And they're called the Platonic Judaism, Hellenistic Jews, you oftentimes see the phrase used. And a primary example of this is a guy by the name of Philo in the first century uh, AD, this first century. This is when Jesus was walking in the Middle East. Well, Philo was doing his thing. And Philo was a, a Jewish historian. He wrote a lot of uh, historical works and and he also developed Plato's ideas and incorporated them into his Judaism. Philo was a Jew, but he was a Hellenistic or a Platonic Jew. He too believed that every human being has an immortal soul that never dies. <clears throat> like Plato, he believed that the immortal soul is freed from the prison of the dead, of the, of the dead body, and for that reason, resurrection is not necessary. Who, want, who needs a resurrection when the, bod, when the soul flies away from the body and goes off to, to be in heaven with God? Why bother with a resurrection? Who needs it? So you got at least three groups of people here who are saying that there's no resurrection of the dead. And I've got to admit that when you look at these philosophies, uh, the Platonic philosophy and, and, and Philo's adoption of the Platonic philosophy, quite frankly, it's easier to believe these things than it is to believe that a body rises from the dead. Um, especially when you think of what happens to bodies in the grave. When you've got Jesus' body, he rose three days or on the third day, actually just over a, a day and some hours, um, Thursday or Friday, Saturday, Sunday is three days in the, in, in the Hebrew world. Um, so he was put to death on Friday, rose early Sunday morning. That is considered three days. Uh, but actually, actually less than 48 hours passed between the two events. And so his body didn't decay much. But now we've got bodies decaying into dust, literally dust, as, as, as God promised Adam in, in Genesis 3, we've got uh, bodies cremated. How do these things get resurrected? 
you know what, rather than trying to answer those questions, we'll just accept the idea of the immortal soul goes off to heaven and the body rots in the ground. It's easier to believe, quite frankly. And so even in the first century, 20 to 30 years after Christ rose from the dead, after Christianity took off because Jesus rose from the dead, Paul is writing to people in Corinth who are saying there is no resurrection from the dead. So to understand this, to understand this whole concept of the platonic immortal soul, we have to go back to Genesis and look at how the Bible treats the concept of the soul. And I'll confess, this, this lesson, as I've worked on it over the past several weeks and months, um, has been eye-opening for me. It's eye-opening to see so many people say the things I'm going to share this morning. But um, the other thing that's been uh, eye-opening is, is just how prevalent Plato's ideas are, even in 21st century conservative evangelical Christianity. So let's go back and look at Genesis chapter 2. And we have this verse, we've looked at that this verse in so many different contexts, but today we're going to look at it from the context of the soul. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is from the King James Version. Man became a living soul. Now, I would tell you that for probably the first 30 years of my Christianity, I would have looked at this verse and I would have said, this verse explains why humans are different from animals. Animals don't have souls. Humans do have souls because it says so right here, man became a living soul. Well, imagine my shock and surprise when I learned about the Hebrew word that is translated soul in this verse. That Hebrew word is nefesh, and forgive me, I know I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, nefesh um, is the word that's translated as soul here. It's also translated in some translations, depending on your Bible, it may say being, it may say creature. And so what's going on here? Well, uh, people who know Hebrew a whole lot better than I do have this to say about this word nefesh. And this is a, the, a Bible, Bible study note from the New English Translation Bible. It's a Bible I love to use because it has so many uh, notes to provide translation guidance from the Greek and Hebrew. The Hebrew term nefesh, translated as being in the New English Translation, is often translated soul, but the word usually refers to the whole person. The phrase nefesh haya, living being, is used of both animals and human beings. And it makes references there to various verses in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, uh, where, where uh, in verse 20, where it talks about God creating all of the living creatures of the sea. That phrase, living creatures, is the exact same Hebrew phrase found in Genesis 2-7, where it says that man became a living soul. Um, no different. Same word, same phrase used in verse 24 and verse 30, talking about the, the, the living creatures walking on the earth. Animals, human beings are both living nefeshes. There's no distinction. Now, to be fair, there is a, 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 con, a, a, a debate going on concerning the phrase breath of life in Genesis 2-7. Um, there are a couple, at least a couple different Hebrew words used for breath. And <clears throat> some scholars will suggest that one of those word forms, the one used in this verse seven only applies to humans. The other one would apply to animals. Other scholars say, no, nah, you're reading too much into that. So I'm not sure. But certainly the word used that is translated as soul in the Old Testament is nephesh. And it does not mean a disembodied uh, spiritual existence apart from a body. That is not what this nephesh word means. And so as we're reading through the Bible, reading through the Old Testament, we come across the word soul in our English translations. Uh, 
most likely, and I, I try to do a, a count, it's 300 and some occurrences of the word soul. And it looked to me like all but one or two of them are a translation of this word nefesh. And, and, and this word nefesh does not mean what we think of in 2021 when we think of the soul. Uh, it simply means the whole person, the whole being. Sometimes it is translated as me, my, you will not leave me in, in Sheol. That's one of the ways uh, Psalm uh, 1610 is translated. Sometimes it says you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Sometimes it says you will not leave me in Sheol. Um, again, it's not, it's talking about more than just a disembodied spiritual soul. And this is reflected in commentary by Ellicott from 1897. Uh, <clears throat> he puts it this way, the word translated soul, and this is a commentary on Genesis 2-7. The word translated soul contains no idea of a spiritual existence. Really, the word refers to the natural life of animals and men maintained by breathing. There's, there's an element of breath, of breathing in, in the word nefesh, that you are a breathing animal. So it wouldn't apply to vegetables or, or, or plants, but it certainly does apply to uh, animals and humans equally. And so throughout the Old Testament, <coughs> we have we, we really don't have a development of any idea of a separate immortal soul. The phrase immortal soul does not appear in the Bible. In Timothy, Paul tells us that only God is immortal. Uh, so the, the notion that, that a human being consists of a mortal body and an immortal soul, while that is very popular in Platonic philosophy, uh, that is not the teaching of the Old Testament. Let's look at from the Greek side, and I've already given some of this. In Greek, the word for soul is suki, from where we get psychology and that sort of thing. Plato was the proponent of, of, of the idea of the soul in 400 BC. He says that the soul is both immortal and eternal. It cannot die. It is not subject to death. It can't die. It also says that it's a consciousness that exists apart from the body. So that when our body dies, the soul, which is all of our thoughts and everything that's going on, well, that keeps on going. That keeps on ticking. That keeps on living. And it's got to go somewhere. And, and for Plato, that somewhere was Hades. So as long as the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and it's talking about nephesh, which is the whole person, body, mind, will, emotions, everything is, is, is bound up into the nephesh. And the Greeks are using suki to describe what they believe is a separate conscious existence. We're okay grammatically or semantically because we have two different languages talking about two different things. Well, the waters got muddy around 250 BC. And this was when the uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek. And it was <clears throat> translated because by this time, more and more people are speaking Greek. And as a result, uh, they need the Bible in Greek. So many, a lot of Middle Eastern Jews, Mediterranean Jews, in 250 BC didn't even speak or read Hebrew. So they needed a, a, a Bible in Greek. When they did this translation, they translated the Hebrew word nefesh into suki. Now this is 250 BC. This is 150 years, 100 to 150 years after Plato. Platonic philosophy is, 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 is gaining a foothold now in the Mediterranean and the Old Testament translators are translating Nefesh into Suki. And it appears to me that along with the translation came the Platonic concept of what a Suki is. It's an immortal, eternal soul. This is a concept that Old Testament Hebrews didn't think about. They didn't separate the body from the soul. 
And this is one of the reasons why death in the Old Testament is looked at so bleakly. Death is an enemy in the Old Testament. I've shared this before. In the Old Testament, death is not something to look forward to. It is an enemy. With Plato, death is my friend. I want to die. I want to leave this, this evil material world behind and fly off to a disembodied bliss. And so <clears throat> during this period between the end of the Old Testament, which was right about the time that Plato was doing his thing, and the beginning of the New Testament in 1 BC or 1 AD or 50 to, to 100 AD, Hellenistic Jews are now incorporating Platonic ideas into their Judaism. And so we have Philo, the first century uh, Jewish historian, who is buying into Plat Plato's teaching about the immortal soul, lock, stock, and barrel. And so now it's getting incorporated into Judaism. Fast forward a few, a couple hundred years. Well, let me get through some of this first. This is what uh, Plato had to say about the soul. In his book, uh, The Republic, he says, the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. That, that's his, his quote. That by itself is just simply Plato's idea. It's, it's what he came up with. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not clearly or necessarily taught in the Old Testament before he came along. But by the second and third century, we have now Christian church fathers, specifically Clement of Alexandria and Oregon, also of Alexandria, both in Egypt, where Platonic philosophy is very much um, in vogue, they start incorporating these Platonic views into their Christianity. Oregon especially uh, is a strong proponent of the immortality of the soul, so much so that like Plato, <clears throat> he believed that the soul is not a created thing. It, it, it pre-existed creation. Um, it was with God, pre-existed creation. And at, after creation, as, as, as people are, are born, God imparts this soul in, into them. And then after they die, the soul, the soul leaves. And, and so these church fathers are now incorporating this platonic view into their Christianity. And it goes on and it goes on and it goes on until we come to 2021. And now this is a, a quote from a website. I was just doing, a re, uh, doing some a search engine on or search on Google uh, for immortal soul. And I found this at a Christian website. It's called compellingtruth.org. This is a, a subsidiary of gotquestions.org. And it's a Christian, Christian organization, Christian group. Uh, look at their statement of faith. There's nothing in there that, that I don't think that any of you would find objectionable. And yet this was one of the first sentences in an article that I was reading about the soul. And it was just sort of, just sort of placed out there as a given. The human soul is that part of a person that is eternal, the part that lives on after the body dies and decays. My guess is, as you've just read that along with me, you're probably sitting there thinking, Virgil, what in the world's wrong with that? Uh, that is a perfect statement of Christian belief in the immortal soul. Um, the thing I'm going to suggest and, uh, is, and it's been suggested by many other people much smarter than I am, is that the Bible doesn't teach this. The Bible doesn't teach that the, the human soul is immortal or eternal or lives on after the body dies and decays. Um, and we'll go through a whole bunch of, of quotes. I've got several screens here of, of quotes of, of this. I mentioned J. Richard Middleton. Uh, he's the guy who's written this book. A New Heaven and a New Earth. I've been using this book for this study. And he has written a, an article online, uh, Paul on the Soul, Not What You Might Think. 
in which he explains Paul's teachings about the soul. And he simply has this um, response to the platonic idea of the soul. We have now come to understand that this view of the soul being immortal and eternal ultimately goes back to Plato. As a Christian, I'm more concerned about what goes back to Genesis and, and Exodus and Leviticus and, and Isaiah and Jeremiah, all of these books written long before Plato came along. And so <clears throat> Middleton puts it that way. Another gentleman who puts it uh, even more starkly and more firmly, this is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. This was first published in 1934, updated in 1960. Uh, <clears throat> it, it says this, we are influenced always, we being Christians, more or less by the Greek platonic idea that the body dies, yet the soul is immortal. Such an idea is utterly contrary to the Israelite consciousness and is nowhere found in the Old Testament. That's a pretty bold statement. I usually try to avoid making statements like, you know, this idea is completely uh, not found in the Old Testament because, you know, I'm sure that somebody, as soon as you say that, you almost challenge somebody to find it. But um, this, this was a Bible teacher from actually from a Dutch reform uh, background who wrote this. Um, but he says that the, the idea of an immortal soul is utterly contrary to the Israelite consciousness. We have N.T. Wright. Um, he has written his book, Surprised by Hope. I've mentioned this book several times. This book and Middleton's book, um, go hand in hand. They, they, they sort of um, <clears throat> teach the same concept, the idea that the Christian um, eschatological hope is not to float off to heaven in a disembodied soul, but rather to populate the earth, the redeemed, restored earth in the new Jerusalem and resurrected bodies. This is the whole point of Christianity, resurrected bodies. <clears throat> N.T. Wright puts it this way. At least since the Middle Ages, the influence of Greek philosophy has been very marked, resulting in a future expectation that bears far more resemblance to Plato's vision of souls entering into disembodied bliss than to the biblical picture of a new, he of a new heavens and a new earth. And so, um, again, Wright is, is looking at this biblically, and he's saying, look, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about immortal souls floating off to heaven. The Bible talks about human beings, whole entire human beings, being raised to life to a new bodily existence. Yes, in a transformed body, a new resurrection body. Uh, and, and who knows what it will look like? I'm not going to speculate on that. But it will be a body. And we're going to live that here on earth. And why is this important? Because when God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, he says it's very good, and he's not giving up on that initial creation. He's not going to give up on it. He's not going to abandon it. His salvation is to restore it and to redeem it. And for this, resurrection is essential. This is why we celebrate Easter. Uh, N.T. Wright mentioned the Middle Ages. I've got a, a, an interesting argument that I found online uh, between William Tyndale and Sir Thomas More. Now let's set our historical stage. William Tyndale, as you all know, uh, was the first person to translate the uh, New Testament directly from the Greek into English. Uh, the prior translations from uh, Wycliffe were from the Latin Vulgate into English. So Tyndale was, was important because he got us the first translation directly from Greek into English. Sir Thomas More, if you'll recall, he was the, the lawyer, statesman, um, uh, church, I believe he was a church layman. I'm not sure what his actual title in the church may have been. Um, but he was the one who objected to Henry VIII's uh, divorce of Catherine of Aragon in order to uh, marry Anne Boleyn. And he also objected to the split from the Roman Catholic Church 
uh, the Anglican Church, the Church of England was established as a result of Henry VIII's divorce from his wife. Sir Thomas More objected to all of that. Um, an amazing man uh, held to his, uh, his convictions and lost his head literally as a result of that. So now you've got William Tyndale and Thomas More, two people that I have an enormous amount of respect for who are disagreeing in this concept of what happens to us when we die. Thomas More took the Platonic view, which, which by now in 1534 was pretty standard Roman Catholic fare that our immortal soul goes somewhere and for the Catholics it was purgatory and then off to, to heaven. Tyndale took the approach of looking at it from the standpoint of resurrection. And so in one of his, uh, uh, one of his written articles, an answer to Sir Thomas More, uh, Tyndale writes this. Now, to be fair, I have highly edited this to make it readable. Uh, Tyndale wrote in 16th century English and, it was, <clears throat> and it's very unreadable. So uh, this is a paraphrase but I get to the heart of it. Tyndale says this or something like this. If Thomas More is correct, then Paul's argument to the Corinthians is worth nothing. For Paul says, if there be no resurrection, we are of all men most miserable. But rather, according to More, we are not most miserable because our souls go to heaven as soon as we die and are there as joyful as Christ. Tyndale says, I, I marvel that Paul had not comforted the Thessalonians with the doctrine that the souls of their dead had been in joy, instead of arguing as he did, that their dead should rise again in resurrection. He's referring to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 here. If the souls in heaven are in as great glory as the angels, as more teaches, show me why we need a resurrection. And this, I believe, goes to the heart of why so many Christians today, from as little as a third to as much as two thirds of people today who call themselves Christians, have no need of biblical resurrection. And the reason for that is because we have adopted Plato's teachings about an immortal soul, so much so that we know that when we pass away, when we die, our soul is going to go immediately into the presence of, of, of God. We are going to be as joyful as Christ. And if that's the case, why are you going to resurrect my body and bring me back to this earth? I don't want that. Like Plato, I don't want to be resurrected. And I don't want to come back to this earth. That our, our embracing of Plato's immortal soul philosophy has created within Christianity no need for the biblical teaching of bodily resurrection. That's a problem. And that I think explains why so many Christians have rejected the idea of bodily resurrection. To summarize, Plato, that the immortal soul is freed from the body at death and lives on in disembodied bliss. Biblical Christianity says that the whole person dies and is then raised to bodily life at the end of the age to live in the new Jerusalem on the new redeemed earth. And there, Revelation tells us we will reign. We will reign forever. We will go back to the job, the vocation, that God gave Adam, and that was to exercise dominion over the earth. Now, if you've got these two teachings, quite frankly, it's easier to accept Plato's system than the Bible's. It's just easier to accept it. The Bible's argument, the Bible's teaching about resurrected bodies is very, very difficult to, to accept. And so I can understand why so many Christians are rejecting the Bible's teaching about resurrection in favor of a platonic idea of a soul rising uh, from, from the dead body and spending eternity in heaven. 
but we're biblical Christians and we're called to be biblical Christians. And the Bible teaches resurrection, bodily resurrection. And this is what, what we are called to, to embrace. In fact, in Romans, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. So this begs a question. And I know this is a question that many of you have on your minds. What about this? What happens to people in the period between their earthly death and their bodily resurrection? Again, with Jesus, it was a little under 48 hours. But for many of us, my grandparents up on, up on the wall behind me, my grandmother died in 1969, my grandfather in 1980-ish, I believe. What has happened to them? What is happening to them as they are awaiting their bodily resurrection? And for that, I will frustrate you by telling you simply, come back next week. We'll talk about the interim state, the intermediate state. And we'll talk about what the Bible says about it, We'll look honestly at what the Bible doesn't say about it, and uh, we'll look at a wide range of teachings from a wide range of different people about this interim state. Um, unfortunately, at least, in, at least in my mind, it's not as clear cut and black and white as I would like it to be. So come back next week. We'll talk about this interim state and where it fits into biblical Christianity.